Hi, this is Toby, and in this video, I'm going to talk to Mike Dunleavy. Mike went to MIT in the 60s, the AI lab in the 70s, and he taught at Boston College in the early 80s. And then he did a few decades of consulting with uh, software startups, and then he developed some software for the pharmaceutical industry as well. He is currently retired. Uh, the way I learned about Mike is through this mind-blowing Stack Overflow post where he taught me about this very simple yet effective technique for profiling your software application without using any special tools. And that's what we're going to be talking about. I hope you have uh, good questions because uh, I, I, my mind is blank. <laughs> well, um, I just found your post very fascinating. Like, I'm going to share my screen so I can show how I learned about you and your work. I was working on improving the performance of uh, a Python program, and I came to the realization that 80% of the time it was Python that was slow. So I rewrote the program in C, and then, and then because I'm in a different language now, I no longer had access to the same profiler I was using in Python. So I was doing some research about how to profile C programs. I ran across this Stack Overflow question and I was like, what do people use in C for profiling? I haven't done C in such a long time. Um, and then so I got an answer like, use Gproof, use call grind. I was like, yeah, those make sense. And then there's your answer. <laughs> it says, basically, you don't need a profiler. You can just do it yourself. You wrote a lot. so. I read through it and you had actually multiple posts on Stack Overflow on uh, multiple occasions where people asked a similar question, right? So um, can you talk a little bit about how these posts came about? Oh gosh, um, well I got in a mode of um, uh, trying to tell people about this and uh, you know it goes way back, what, 10 years? Uh -huh. Yeah, you actually wrote a paper about it, and I, I leave oh, it. more than one. Uh, yeah, more than one paper, uh, uh, and papers on other subjects as well. But it's like, you know, I realized when I was teaching that um, um, students basically believe they're professors, which is natural, mm -hmm. um, but the professors don't know this. <laughs> And so there we are, you know, and there's all this, there's all this uh, uh, history of GProf and everything. If you look into the history of GProf, it was never really intended for what uh, people think it's good for, uh, and including what professors think it's good for. So, so there yeah. you go. One thing about your method that I would say, there's very little to it. Like there's very little to understand. It's not like there's multiple things to unpack. Uh, it's very easy to understand. Uh, when you actually do it, it's quite easy to do, even though it might be slightly tedious. It's it's so simple that I almost feel like I should already know this. I, I feel like when, once, I, once I've learned it, I feel like I should already know this. And I almost want to convince myself that in fact I did already know this, and this guy is just trying to con me into thinking, you know, he this is a new thing, but <laughs> but I don't, that's obviously not true. It, it feels like it's it, it's almost strange to me that I have not learned this earlier in my career. What 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 do you make of that? Well, programmers have teachers, and they and they learn what the teachers know. And the, the thing is, very few teachers have had much real experience. What I found was that there were other people in the world who, who knew that uh, technique, um, but they didn't think, they thought everybody knew it, or they didn't, mm. it didn't bother them that uh, other people didn't know it, so what's the big deal? Yeah, but perhaps th those practitioners that are doing this they are not uh, making it known. I didn't think it was that big a deal myself um, because I just thought of it as, 
one tool in the toolbox uh, for doing all kinds of problems. Go ahead. Do you mind if I try to demonstrate? You, you can do this in variety of languages. I'll try a Python one. Okay, so this is a Python program. It's running a long job. If I just kill it with Control C, it prints a call stack. Yeah. Uh, or the stack trace or the back trace, uh, sure. various different terminologies for the same thing. So this shows me basically exactly what point in the algorithm the program was, what line of code it was, and it, within that line of code, within which function call it was, and the whole chain of function calls um, that's on the stack at that point. So. Good question. Which is the, which is the innermost and which is the outermost? The bottom is the innermost and the okay. top is the outermost. Uh, this is the main function, which is the oh, outermost. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. One 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 reason I thought your method is so uh, so obvious <laughs> retrospectively is that with a lot of programming languages, Python is one of them. I I automatically get this stack trace when the program is interrupted for any reason. But basically your technique is like you do this once to capture a stack trace and then you would you would like I I put it in like a text file, just a normal text file. And then I'll say, hey, this was sample one. And then I do this again. And then you you, the the thing is when you, you when you hit the interrupt the control C that's happening at a random time the program is just tight tight looping and yeah. then and then so when you when you interrupt it like it could be at any moment in time it's completely random it's right. completely by chance where the execution happens to be at that point in time yeah. so thus a random sampling method. Uh, so the fact that the last time I interrupted it, it was at this parsing function, and it was calling this eval. Eval is like a Python core library. It, it evals a Python expression, actually. And then yeah. this time, I got the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, that's by chance, but also not so much by chance. <laughs> Well, that, um, you can conclude from that that it's spending probably almost all of its time doing that. Yeah, the, the parsing appears to be slow, which is what I also found uh, using other methods. So this is totally consistent with what I know. Uh, now, the third sample, it's actually doing a database insertion. Uh -huh. so, so maybe another part of the program that's slow is when it has to do some database work. Um, and then uh, this is a different place as well. This is, this is just- Oh, okay. So two out of four times it was doing that uh, oh, parsing. Yep, two out of four times it was doing a parsing and then, uh, and then one time was database and then another time this is get type by value um, I think get type by value, just a couple of if statements and maybe a dictionary lookup or something like that. And then, and then another, another thing for parsing. So the parsing is definitely looking like it's one of the culprits, the parsing. Um, hey there, uh, this is Toby interjecting from the future. Uh, because we didn't go through an end-to-end -end process of using Mike's method in the video, I kind of want to show you what the end result might look like. This is an actual report uh, that I handmade uh, using a simple text file. Uh, I did this on the C version of my recreate program. First, I took 20 stack traces as we shown in the video. Um, and uh, each one I just pasted into this text file and you can see there's 20 of them. After I'd done that, I went through each one and then categorized them, usually by the line of code that is the deepest one in the stack trace that is still inside my code, not in the library code. So in this one, for example, is recreate 1121. 
uh, which happen quite often actually. And once I find that line of code, I actually paste the source code here as well so that I can see what that line of code is. And after I sort of categorized them and tally the numbers, I found that actually 14 out of 20 of my samples, the code was actually spending within this line. The database driver is committing a transaction. The remaining 30%, it was spent in this process event function, which then I further broke down into these four distinct lines. But two of these distinct lines are also code inside the database driver. Thus, if I add these two together with these 14, I can conclude that about 80% of the time, the program was spending inside the database driver. Uh, that's what I want to say now. I'll let you get back to the interview. One of the things that you said in, in your post, in your paper, is that this method, uh, when compared to a typical profiler, which actually I'll, I'll try to run a typical profiler for Python. C profile. Oh, except that I'm going to have to. Oh, ah, okay, that's good enough. I interrupted it and it did it. Because yeah, I didn't want to have to wait too long. So a typical profiler would give you output like this. Huh. <laughs> um, and, and you can and you can sort tell it to sort that this table of data based on one of the statistics. Like so you can sort it either by cumulative time or total time. Whereas cumulative time would be the amount of time it took to uh, execute this entire function. Whereas the total time would be the amount of time it took to execute this function minus the amount of time its child function calls took. So it, it would, the total time would be more like a representation of how much time you know, was spent just inside the function itself, not its child calls. Um, you use one or the other, depending on sort of what you're trying to do. So let's 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 do say do cumulative time first. Um, so this is like saying the the top cumulative time is the built-in exec function in Python, and this is the main module. You'd huh? be surprised. You'd be surprised if that didn't accumulate uh, count for all the time. Yeah, yeah. It it's it just like Python doing everything. And then this is my main function. Yeah, that it should take up a lot of time. And then the parse is is up there. So uh, that that's we kind of already know that the parsing is up there. And then we have processing commands is also kind of up there. Um, with with this one, it there's a lot of statistics and and it kind of flattens it out and then sorts it in a table. Um, whereas with this one where we took the samples by hand, what I find myself doing is, um, is I, after I take these samples, I go back and look at each stack trace and I categorize it in a way that makes sense for me. Um, because I, I wrote the code. I have a good understanding of what the code is trying to do. So I, I'm looking at this code and I, I, I look at the entire stack trace and I like, well, this is parsing, right? I, I will just very automatically lump it into a part that's meaningful to me, which is, the, that's the parsing part. So I probably just categorize the point, the point is that you're getting line number information out of this, whereas the, you, you tend not to get line number information out of uh, profilers. I mean, okay. some do, and yeah. and the other thing you're getting is is um, you're getting it on wall clock time, which means that you can tell when it's doing um, input or output. Whereas with m most profilers, just do CPU time. So uh, it could be spending nine tenths of its time reading, and you would never know it. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I think if it were doing I/O time. It would probably count towards the total time for the function. That's well, that's one of the things you need to understand about any profiler is does it does it work on 
on wall clock time or on CPU time. Mm -hmm. Many of them assume that, well, IO time is stuff that you can't do anything about, so why bother profiling it? The thing is, you might be spending nearly all of your time doing IO and the profiler would never see it. If you got a big program, you know, it could be doing IO that doesn't really serve any purpose. And you'd like to know that. Mm -hmm. Well, one problem that I kind of ran into when I was using this profiler in Python, it's all the functions in my program. And I wasn't sure which functions were overlapping with which other functions. I wanted to get a big picture of, hey, which is the part that's slow? Is it the database? operations that are slow. I want it to sort of like um, section my program off into these top level chunks and then be able to say, hey, this chunk is 40% or something. And that chunk maybe is 60%. I wanted to be able to do that. It wasn't that straightforward for me looking at this table to, to get that information out. Okay. Let me, you hit a general point there. One of the things that people are taught is to think of, of a particular part of the program as being uh, the bottleneck or the thing that takes time. Whereas if you look at uh, uh, stack shots, what it's telling you is why the time is being spent, not where. I mean, it tells you where the time is being spent, but much more important is, is why the time is being spent. And if you know why, then you can tell if you need to do it or not. Yeah. So that's yeah. very, that's a, a, an important distinction from just saying, oh, it's in the foobar function. Yeah, yeah, it, that is very true. Like to, to sort of work around this limitation of reading this data, I said, I have a top level parsing function that is gonna contain all of the stuff that's dealing with the parsing. So if I look at this line, then I know more or less that that time is responsible for all of the parsing and that should be non-overlapping with the rest of the program. I added a process command function that wraps most of the rest of the processing outside of the parse line just so that I ha can have the report tell me, hey, this is the processing part of the program and that's the total tally of that. Uh, but then later on, I realized that, that even though it wasn't a lot of time spent in there, there is one edge case where the processing command is calling the parsing to, and that just throws the numbers off. So, you know, <laughs> that's sort of the disadvantage of this flattened chart like this. I've looked at many profilers and they, they all do something screwy somewhere. And, uh, but it all, but in, in every case, the, the problem is in the summaries. Mm. The yeah, problem is that they summarize and in, in the process of, of doing the summary, they throw away the information that actually tells you what they need to know. Actually, there's an interesting profiler that is commonly used in the JavaScript community. I would like to show it to you and see what you think of it. Um, so it's, it's a tool inside of Chrome. So if you go to the perform, let's do it on the stack overflow site. So I'm going to record and then I'm going to load the site. And then when it's done loading, I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. That's good because I'm a bit of a newbie to uh, JavaScript. Um, I'm a newbie to C. Okay. There's not a lot of JavaScript execution happening until the very end. So, uh, so like all of this white space means no CPU usage. Uh, the, this little, this latter part at the very end, which you can zoom in, there's some CPU usage. And what you see here is a, what they call it a flame chart. Oh um, yeah. Each, each, uh, rectangle here is a, uh, stack as a stack on the stack frame and then yeah. you can zoom in uh you, i think you can like pinch pinch to zoom like these very very thin lines they're just very thin rectangles and you can actually zoom in so much that yeah. you can see the function name 
you can if think you of want it. to know i'll tell you what's wrong with flame graphs okay yeah okay <clears throat> there can be a function whose whose elapsed time is very short but which is called in a thousand places and if there's a performance bug in that routine you'll never see it on a flame chart because mm. the little boxes of where that function is called are sprinkled all over the place. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, if you look at call stacks during that time, you know, that function will show up the percentage of time that it occupies. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have seen situations similar to that when I, when I'm debugging JavaScript, large JavaScript applications, most of the time it's like, Oh, there's this, really long rectangle and that's obvious and then i yeah, just zoom the in it's, and the reason it's long is because of all this stuff underneath it yep there's all the stuff underneath it but once in a while i have a situation where there's a lot of asynchronous events getting put on the queue to be executed later and that is actually <laughs> taking a huge performance hit the number of little tasks to be yeah put on the queue is so great that instead of getting one long rectangle, you have millions of tiny slices, t tiny yep, yep, lines yep. that are sort of sprinkled over a area. And yep. that, that's sort of the something you're talking about, kind of matches that profile. I call it hiding. Um, the, the performance problems have all kinds of ways to hide from you. And you can you can think they're in a flame graph. They're hiding from you. They're all kinds of you know hot paths. They can hide from you. When I uh, when I share your technique with my wife, uh, one one thing she said was that well, isn't that kind of tedious to do? Like you you probably don't want to do this by hand if a large part of your job has this kind of work in it. What what well, what do you think? I, about I have that? a standard answer to that. Yeah which is while you're trying to figure out how to work the profiler and what the limitations of the profiler are, you can already finish the job with, with the debugger. <laughs> and, and part of the, the reason for saying it, it would be tedious is thinking you need lots of samples. You don't. Mm -hmm. how, how many samples do you normally do? 10 or 20. 10 or 20. Yeah, that's, you you wrote that in your post and that I follow that advice. So I did, I did 10 and then I thought, Oh, I can do some more. I did 20. The thing is, the thing is if, if you've got a bug that's worth fixing, it takes enough time that you'll see it in a small number of samples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I think that the way you laid it out in your paper is really instructive. You, you said like, if there's a problem, but let's say it's a, you later on said it's maybe we should call it an opportunity, but in either in either way you can think of it as, well, there's a section of of your program that's taking some percentage of time. That percentage is related to how probable it is that you're going to be stopped inside oh, yeah. of that section of the code. You you not only got to know what what percentage of time it takes, but whether it's necessary. Yes. And that's the context the programmer had. And, the, and only the programmer can tell if it's necessary. Like if it spends a lot of time, say, writing a log file and then nobody reads it, you'd say, well, why bother? I mean, I knew from simulating clinical trials that they have such a, they have a thing called, they call it alpha and beta. Okay. But what that is, is the probability of getting a false positive versus the probability of getting a false negative. A false positive is if you say the drug works when it doesn't. A false mm -hmm. negative is if the drug does work, but your trial doesn't show it. And the, the thing is, when you're doing performance tuning, a false positive is where you identify a problem that's not really a problem. Mm -hmm. A false negative is where there is a problem there and you don't see it. And right. that, that is the remarkable thing. You can have one. You can have one bug that's taking half of the time, 
and you can have another bug that's taking a quarter of the time, and you can have another bug that's taking one eighth of the time. And if you fix all three of those, if you find them, you're eight times faster. But if you miss any one, you're nowhere near eight times faster. And uh, if any one of those hides from you, produ produ producing a false negative, you're not going to get it. And also, if you get the one that's one eighth of the time, that's not nearly as good as if you get the one that's half of the time. Yeah, exactly. If you if you get the one eighth of the time, but you don't get the one half or the one quarter of the time, you speed up. You say, "Yippee! I gained fifteen percent." Whoa! <laughs> Who cares? Yep. So that's that's the problem with profilers is is that um, real problems hide from them. They give you false negatives.